Congressman Jim Hines is the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, and he joins me now. And I want to talk about those appointments, but I just want to start with the news from uh, over the last 24 hours about the release of these four, or the rescuing of these four hostages. And we've all seen those videos, incredibly touching, seeing people reconnect with their families. Now, Jake Sullivan this morning acknowledged that a ceasefire and hostage deal is the best way to get the remaining hostages out, in addition to, of course, ending this war. And I just wanted to ask you, I mean, can the rest of the hostages be rescued through military operations in your assessment? And how concerned are you if that is the planned approach, especially given the civilian death toll that we saw uh, with this operation? Yeah, good to be with you, Jen. Um, the the rescue operation uh, was a remarkable operation, you know, in the tradition of uh, Israeli special forces going back to the raid on Entebbe, where they, uh, you know, rescued uh, civilians from a hijacked airliner uh, in Africa. Um, but the answer to your question is no, no, there's simply no way, uh, you know, these operations succeed because of exquisite planning, competence, but also luck. And, uh, you know, luck is not always on your side. Uh, mm -hmm. Anybody who needs to uh, reminder of that, need just watch, uh, you know, the Mogadishu operation that led to the movie. So, no, that is not an option. The only option for the freeing of all of the hostages, of course, is for all parties to agree to a uh, cessation of hostilities and a release of hostages. And, uh, you know, I, I know that Bill Burns and others are working away on that, but that's also a very, very heavy lift. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is addressing Congress next month, um, and the United States and even leaders within Israel, many, you, you included, have been pressing him for a clear plan on how we will end the war and, and, and what will happen in Gaza on the day after. This is something U.S. officials have been pressing for since the beginning. He seems to be ignoring the, these pleas while also proceeding with a military campaign. Is there more leverage you think the United States should be using to push Netanyahu to produce that plan? And what, what do you hope to hear from him when he is here next month? Yeah, I, I mean, of course, there is more leverage, and it, I mean, it's it's terribly painful to talk about, much less apply, right? Because Israel was attacked here, and look, I've been critical of the way they have conducted the uh, the the war, and there's plenty of room to be critical about that. But I guess at the core of this, uh, Jen, is the fact that um, you know there is no way for Israel to win this purely militarily, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Hamas, disgusting terrorists though they may be, have a vision for a future. And it's a dark, horrible, evil vision. But my complaint with the prime minister, apart from the way he has conducted this war, I think, without uh, enough sort of attention to the humanitarian situation, is that he has offered no alternative vision. He mm -hmm. shot down the concept of a two-state solution. You cannot win this unless you participate or at least put forward some sense of hope for the future on the part of Palestinians. If you don't do that, they will adhere to the disgusting and dark vision that Hamas or others offers. And it's time for the prime minister to actually engage in what the future of the Palestinian people might and should look like. Which he seems resistant, hesitant, all of the things to do. Well, let me ask you, let me just turn to the intel appointments, because you've spoken about this a little bit. I know and I believe you have a great deal of respect for uh, the chairman, Turner. Um, and it's, it sounds like from the reporting, he learned about those appointments to the committee through news reports. Have you talked to him specifically about this? Is that true? Well, I don't, I don't want to get into my private discussions with the chairman. Look, one of the reasons I don't want to do that is because Chairman Turner and I have worked very hard, 24-7 for the last year, to reestablish the Intelligence Committee as mm -hmm. a nonpartisan context in which people, though we have different ideologies and belong to different parties, where we are laser-focused on the, you know, probably never more critical uh, job of making sure that the intelligence community is doing what it's doing. So, you know, in the service of that, I'm not going to, you know, open fire on these two new appointments. I'm just going to observe that, you know, for generations, speakers of both parties have appointed the most serious-minded, uh, the least flammable and volatile members, and now we see the appointment of two people with a history of, uh, I would argue, putting Donald Trump's interests ahead of, uh, of, of the national interest. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go further than that because I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, whether they deserve it or not, in the service of trying to keep this committee uh, functional. But, you know, uh, Donald Trump, from the moment he became president, showed, showed his disdain both for the 
intelligence community as well as for the truth uh, that they are all about providing uh, to power. So, uh, again, this is very concerning, particularly when you saw uh, Congressman Perry's statement about how, mm -hmm. well, now the committee will finally do real oversight. What an insult to Chairman Turner and to the people mm -hmm. who've been toiling in those vineyards for a very, very long time. So fingers crossed, but it's, uh, it's it not a happy day for me anyway. It's such an important point. The Intel Committee, Democrats and Republicans have historically worked together to address so many important issues, such an important tradition. Thank you so much, Congressman Jim Himes, for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time.